On the 2nd of April 1908, a memorial cross was dedicated in Moscow to the Grand Duke Sergei, governor of the city and uncle of Tsar Nicholas II, who had been assassinated at that spot three years earlier. Grand Duke Sergei's life, personality and legacy have been very much disputed, whilst that of his widow, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, has been widely celebrated and deeply admired. At Elizabeth's commission, the inscription on this huge memorial cross, seven meters high, was simply the gospel text, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Princess Elizabeth of Hesse had arrived in Moscow for her marriage in 1884 at the age of 20. A granddaughter of Queen Victoria, brought up as a Lutheran but with an Anglican mother, she was related to many of the royal and noble houses of Europe. She is the great-great-aunt of our current king. It was by her own choice that she converted to orthodoxy just before Easter 1891, a decision which would become a watermark of the rest of her life and a faith which would become more intense in extraordinary ways after her husband's assassination. Hers was a life which can be seen in two halves. The first, as a court beauty, a princess of great style and wealth and one of the most eligible women in Europe. The second, as a religious superior and as a res resolute witness to the depths of God's love in Christ. The night before her husband's funeral, Elizabeth asked Moscow's prefect of police to escort her to the Taganka prison to meet the assassin Ivan Kalyaev, who was a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Combat Organization, which had previously assassinated two ministers of the interior. Her sister, Princess Victoria of Hesse, recalls in her unpublished memoirs that Elizabeth had hoped that this would be a secret encounter in which she might awaken the assassin to repentance. However, the then French ambassador to the imperial court, Maurice Paleologue, recounts a version of the meeting and the tone of their subsequent correspondence in his memoirs. Elizabeth spoke to the prisoner, not as a princess, but as a widow, and gave Kalyaev a copy of the gospel with a request that he read it. Some accounts state that Elizabeth then offered to intercede for him with the Tsar if he would repent. Although Kalyaev refused, Elizabeth wrote anyway, seeking a pardon. Different narratives of Kalyaev's attitude towards a plea spread throughout Moscow. And finally, Maurice Palyalog records that Elizabeth received a letter from the prisoner which read as follows. I did not say I am sorry, because I am not. If I agreed to hear what you had to say, it was only because I regarded you as the unfortunate widow of a man whom I had executed. The account you have given of our interview is an insult to me. I don't want the mercy you have asked for me. This tragic story, with all its human and political complexity, sets before us the Christian imperative to forgive, whilst also focusing the human heart on the need to learn how to accept forgiveness. It was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, writing from a much later context of a different kind of violent political and ethical landscape, who famously said that there could be no future without forgiveness. As South Africa emerged from the horrors of apartheid, Tutu reflected that forgiveness had to trump not only retributive justice, but even restorative justice. Only forgiveness can open the space where seemingly irreconcilable histories and contexts can turn a page. Only reconciliation can do the hard work. The only final medicine for hatred is love. This kind of love bore extraordinary fruit in Elizabeth's life and orbit. The trauma of assassination and widowhood were channeled with huge energy and determination into a project of imagination and Christian generosity. She sold all her jewels, and in February 1909, 
opened the convent of Saints Martha and Mary in Moscow, a religious house where women could take temporary vows while serving the sick and the poor. When this convent was opened and the first sisters received, she said to them, I am leaving the brilliant world where I occupied a high position, and now, together with all of you, I am about to ascend into a much greater world, the world of the poor and afflicted. Hers was a new model in the Russian Orthodox tradition, and members of the community would often leave the convent with a wide range of skills. After the example of the two sisters of Bethany and friends of Jesus, Martha and Mary, Elizabeth's vision was one both active and contemplative. This convent was a church and medical center rolled into one. A devout life of orthodox prayer underpinned a shelter, a pharmacy, an orphanage, and a hospital. It was said that Elizabeth took her religious vows even more seriously than her marriage vows. And her decision to enter the religious life was one which created tension amongst the imperial family and high society. The only member of her family to be present on the occasion of her religious profession was her sister, Princess Victoria. Their mother had consulted Florence Nightingale about the foundation of a women's health association called the, called the Alice Hahnwein in Hesse, which, although a secular institution, followed the model of a religious mother house. And in some ways, the Grand Duchess's vision for the Martha Mariinsky convent was surely influenced by the interweaving of these themes. Furthermore, familiar with the activities recently re-emerging at the time of Western deaconesses, the rule of the convent spoke of its sisters following the ancient example of the holy myrrh bearers and deaconesses. Elizabeth added her powerful voice to those already proposing the restoration of the rank of deaconess in the Russian church as a distinctive participation in its pastoral life. During the Martha Mariinsky's peak years between 1914 to 17, around 150 sisters were members of this community, working in healthcare and amongst the homeless poor of Moscow. It is clear from all the sources that Elizabeth had the character of a charismatic religious founder, and that she used her influence and energy to create a highly distinctive kind of community. Her own personality was right at the heart of this. Her sister, Princess Victoria, recalled how patients would often ask for Ella, as she was known, to be present with them in their last hours. Victoria records in her memoirs. In one case, the husband, who was very devoted to his wife, was a communist, and he and Ella each held the hand of the dying woman. The husband afterwards said to one of the nurses that if all the members of the imperial family were like this one, the first one he had ever met, his opinion of them would be different. But this status amongst the poorest of Moscow was not sufficient to save her. After the Tsar's abdication of 1917, she was relieved of all her charitable responsibilities apart from the convent. An offer of sanctuary came from the Kaiser by the Swedish ambassador, which she refused. On the 7th of May, 1918, the third day of Easter, Elizabeth was arrested and accompanied by one of her sisters, Varvara, to Alapayevsk. On the day after the murder of the Tsar, Elizabeth and Varvara were thrown into the mine shaft, into which grenades were then dropped. The precise circumstances of their martyrdom are still contested. They may have been killed beforehand. One soldier present at the scene testified later that as Elizabeth was seized, she cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When her body was exhumed two years later, an icon of Christ given to her on the day of her religious profession was found on her chest alongside two unexploded grenades. In a final journey of astonishing length and complexity 
a story in its own right, she was ultimately buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, yards from where Jesus himself prayed and was betrayed on the night before he died. The first monument in the Moscow Kremlin to be destroyed after the October Revolution of 1918 was Grand Duke Sergei's memorial cross with that inscription, Father, forgive. Forgiveness is fragile. To forgive is always a choice, an active decision, which, if embraced, can liberate and lead to a new future. Elizabeth's life, including her death, shows us that from forgiveness can emerge new possibilities bearing rich fruit, which would otherwise be impossible. We might call such a world the new creation, because its origin is none other than the reconciling love of Christ himself. Learning how to forgive, learning how to accept forgiveness, especially in contexts of complexity and confusion, is the work of a lifetime. But it is a work which gives life and which robs the grave of its victory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.